So I'll let you guys take it away. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessen Farrell, she, her. I am a former state representative from uh, the 46th district, and I now work at Civic Ventures. And um, I mean, like all of us, deeply concerned about the affordable housing crisis. And I hope that we can all collectively figure out how to go really big in our solutions on it. Peter, why don't you go next? Sure. <laughs> Peter Orser, I'm the retired CEO of the Warehouser Real Estate Company, but still very engaged in all things housing, including cottages and green canopy, a green town home builder in town. I'm on the board of the Rundstad Department of Real Estate, past chair. So all the things I have done and I continue to do are about housing. So. I am not tired, but I am retired um, and excited about this uh, big idea that we're going to talk about today. Great. And how about you, Rick? Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Moeller. I'm an associate professor of architecture at the University of Washington. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I also serve on the Seattle Planning Commission. And I got involved in this partly because I teach a fair number of interdisciplinary urban design studios focused on transit-oriented development at the University of Washington. Thanks. And Emily, if you are out there, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, I do not hear Emily. So Emily Ho is our absolutely fabulous program ma manager whose power just went out. Um, so I am going to do the slide deck. So the way this will work is I am going to do a short slide deck. Emily was teed up to do the deck, so I will try to do her deck justice. And then uh, Peter, Rick, and I will say a few remarks, and then we'll pivot into questions and really actually workshopping our idea. So I'm going to jump into the deck. So um, our goal, we are, um, let's see if I can make this work. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Okay. So here are our four pictures. Um, so we will be presenting to you today, but I will skip this one since you guys already got a chance to meet us. Um, so as I said, we're gonna do a few minutes of an, um, a deck and then we'll do some closing remarks and then we will uh, really look to you all to provide reactions and feedback to the idea that we're going to present. Our hope is that you will have some really great ideas for us as we, as we present this. Um, okay, so as we are all deeply aware, um, there is a really major housing crisis. It was bad before COVID. It is even worse now. And it is felt by all different kinds of people in our community. Um, you know, whether you are a young person trying to find stable housing, an elder person, you know, trying to age in place, um, our housing uh, history has meant that there are deeply racist uh, impacts, uh, particularly to black and indigenous members of our community. Um, and, you know, people are having to drive quite a ways to get to their jobs. It's felt in all different kinds of ways. And in describing it in, in, a, in a big way, we're hoping that many people can kind of see themselves or their family members in this, in this crisis. It, it really impacts all of us in a lot of different ways. Um, and so we have come together, we are a group of um, public and private sector and nonprofit uh, professionals who have worked on various civic issues over the last 20, 30, 40 years among us. Uh, we call ourselves Sound Communities. And we really see this opportunity to really go big and to really think big in how we approach this problem. 1.8 million people are expected to move to the region. Um, over the next 20, 30 years. And of course, we have created this massive investment in transit. $53 billion uh, will be spent to build out the spines of our light rail line, invest in bus rapid transit, and of course, commuter rail. And we have this opportunity to really scale up our housing investments um, along these rail lines. And so that is what our hope and purpose is. And so, not only are we wanting to figure out how we can really scale up our investment in transit-oriented development, but of course to learn from the mistakes of the past 
and really focus on how do we make those communities equitable? How do we make sure that people who are living in communities are not displaced and gentrified out? How do we make sure that our communities are complete uh, where we have, you know, uh, public sector infrastructure like schools and parks and also jobs. Uh, and then also really, again, as I mentioned, people oriented. How do we make these investments in transit really work for, for our, for broad swaths of our community? And so, um, so sound communities, as I said, came together and Peter, Emily, and Rick Muller and I are a few of our, um, uh, the people who are behind this effort. And we are doing several things to kind of hone this idea. And I will jump into this specific idea, but, um, but undergirding um, what I'm about to present is a fiscal and policy analysis. We are engaging community and we are also working with municipalities who are really going to be struggling uh, on how to house, house people as they have been struggling. Okay, so what is uh, the idea that we have? So some of you who um, I know in the audience uh, may know that my background is in transportation and that I was a transit advocate coming into uh, my work as a legislator and, and kind of post-legislative work. And one of my uh, thoughts is that in the transportation sector, we've been really successful in massively scaling up investments. We've um, you know, at the state level and at the local level and at the regional level. And so the thought experiment that our Sound Communities group really kind of came to is how do we massively scale up our housing investment to meet both the need, but also to be commensurate with our, um, with our transit investments. And so we have borrowed a lot, uh, pretty baldly from the transportation sector in, in this particular idea. Um, and so the basic idea is to uh, borrow from a tool in transportation called the Transportation Benefit District. And if we were all in the room together, I would have everyone raise your hand and, you know, if you knew, if you had ever heard of a Transportation Benefit District, so I could kind of get a sense of, of the knowledge base of the audience. But I can't do that because we're all together. Um, but the basic idea behind a transportation benefit district is it gives local jurisdictions, if they have done the planning work and if they have done the coordination work with the region and the state, additional funding tools. They basically get an incentive for doing the right thing. And that is what we have done by uh, borrowing this tool and kind of morphing it into a housing tool. So we are calling it the Sound Communities Bill because that's a catchier name, but really it is a housing benefit district. And what it does is it allows a local jurisdiction, either a county or a city, and this could be a statewide tool, um, so any county or city across the state could use it, although the need is particularly acute in the Puget Sound region, there is also a statewide housing crisis. Um, and it would allow a, a, a city or, or a county, after they have done um, particular, after they've met particular planning benchmarks, for example, doing analyses around uh, gentrification or displacement, doing um, adjustments to their comp plan to, um, to meet growth management requirements and, and, and benchmarks in, um, in our regional plan, for example. After they've done a suite of things, and um, they actually mirror what was in uh, Representative Fitzgibbon's bill from a couple years ago, and I know all of you guys know the bill number, and I bet somebody could even put that in the chat because it is not on my brain right now, um, but I'll bet somebody knows what it is. So, so as once a, um, a jurisdiction met these planning requirement goals, um, they would get access, they would be able to form a, a, a housing benefit district where they would get additional financing tools um, and uh, then would be able to purchase land um, for, uh, you know, for uh, putting together parcels, they would be able to lease that land. Um, and Peter, why don't I actually jump to you and you can say a little bit about what this particular element would allow a, a housing benefit district to do. And then I'll jump back into the other um, things that a, a benefit district could do. Yeah, with the solid planning behind you, 
um, I think the primary objective is in essence to become a land bank. And the way I look at it is tolling the market clock. Um, so with the capital raised through uh, our financing mechanisms in an HBD, we would begin the process of acquiring key parcels, uh, difficult parcels, assemble parcels into more efficient development opportunities, um, and uh, try to create value through that acquisition program. Now, the objective has affordability at the very top of its mantra, um, divided really into three rough categories, which is below 80%, extremely low, very low income, workforce housing, I call it 80 to 120%, and then the market above uh, 120%. So the objective fundamentally is to control land, allowing a nonprofit and for market developer who might be working on workforce housing, a public agency to go and assemble their permits, their financing, their, their plan to then begin to execute. As most of you all well know, our current experience is the market runs away from us very quickly as soon as there is a whiff in the air that this station is going to be near ready. And it makes it very difficult then to, um, it just adds another burden of the many burdens to the capital stack in trying to create uh, affordable housing. So fundamentally, um, the fact that we would, in essence, toll the market, hold land for a period of years, I said five, it could be three to five years, and then resell it back into um, the applicant to uh, at, at the old market price, trying to create, in fact, some subsidy value uh, for the vertical um, development. Our job is horizontal. It's about um, assembly, planning first, but assembling, and then bringing an infrastructure element to the program as well. I, what I've been most amazed at is, this is a hole in the fabric of our communities. Cities are working desperately and without resources on a wide variety of issues. Sound Transit's trying to run a railroad and build a station, and in fact has no authority outside of their station parcels. And so there's a, a gap, which in fact is an opportunity in what we view as a half mile walk shed around each uh, TOD. Um, and so that's fundamentally the financing mechanism. Um, there are other tools we are investigating and figuring out how to apply, some of which are not available to us today, but we're thinking in the very, very long term. But that act alone of acquiring and assembling and creating value through that um, and tolling the market clock is, is a big head start. My sense is we would also be deploying market rate parcels in, back into the system at market rate or better. And so, in fact, if we bought a parcel for $100 and sold it back into the market for 120, that just gives us principle that we can continue to recycle into the affordability mantra. So all these things have to work together, but I think you know one of the, the value points for us is to be very strict on the nexus between um, execution and affordability. Uh, 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 we've had some really good feedback that this all sounds good, but it tends to drop off if we're not executing at a high level. But as Justin said, the plan itself will create a number of criteria that will ensure that mix of affordability and more to the point, uh, reflect on the displacement issues that may be an issue as we go in. Um, so. I think that's it in a nutshell, Jessen. Is that enough for yep, you? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I'll just do there a couple more slides and then we'll turn it over to Rick. So um, so those are the basic gist. The, uh, a local city or county could also partner with a contiguous county or city so that you can start to experiment with a regional approach. 
Um, there would be an advisory board that would be able to help smaller jurisdictions with some of those more complex acquisition issues. Um, so there are a number of things in it. And in particular, what we're really diving in deep right now to really um, make sure we're, we're, we're getting right is, again, this issue of racial equity. How are you providing pathways to stability, whether that is around um, keeping people from being displaced by acquiring currently low income um, buildings or creating additional pathways to ownership through more non-traditional methods like community land trusts? or equitable co-ops and to make sure that those strategies are built into a jurisdiction's plan before getting access to the tool. So that's something we're working through. The issue of income limits is very real and it matters and being very explicit about tying the, the public benefit to um, low income housing and very low income housing. That's really important. And then finally, what does success look like and how do you evaluate that we are building communities that are truly equitable, sustainable, and vibrant? And what are the right evaluation criteria for that? So those are all the things that we're really deep in workshop mode and would love feedback and your perspectives on. Um, Rick, why don't you talk a little bit about the study that we're going to be doing and some of the work that we're doing with jurisdictions? And then um, I think they're just maybe one or two slides after this. Oh, Rick, you're on mute. <laughs> Sure, I was gonna talk a little bit about neighborhoods too, if that's okay. Yes, do it. Um, so we're starting with an initial study and we're working with real estate students at the University of Washington and the College of Built Environments. Peter is involved in that. I'm involved in that. Um, Anna Bonilla, who is also a Sound Committee's, Communities uh, Steering Committee member is involved. And the three station areas we're looking at to start are Everett, Renton and Tacoma. So we're in three different counties. Um, we have two stations that are light rail, one that is bus rapid transit. Um, we're working with a firm called City Builder that Peter has connections with who is doing some data generation. And what the students are going to do is basically look at ways in which we can catalyze and incentivize development and to actually accelerate the development that could happen at these stations to generate value, as Peter has talked about. Um, and so the idea is we generate the value and that value can then be used to provide additional affordability or to provide additional amenities within each of these communities. And I should say that one of the reasons that we selected these three jurisdictions is that they have a very, very enthusiastic um, uh, leadership, very enthusiastic planning staff, and uh, we're quite excited to get this going. We'll be doing this study basically through about the middle of October, and we'll use that data that we generate to ideally um, really build the case for what we're doing. Sorry. Um, Keep going, that, Rick. I just that's okay. lost control here. So, so okay. as, as you're gathering, this is what we're doing is, is really quite wonky. Um, but what this is fundamentally about is, is building great neighborhoods. And so what do we mean by great neighborhoods? Well, a great neighborhood is diverse. It has racial diversity, diversity of household types. These households have a diversity of incomes. The neighborhood has both renters and homeowners. And to achieve this, we need a diversity of housing types from ground related missing middle housing, like townhouses, duplexes, triplexes, and courtyard housing, to larger apartment buildings with a range of unit types. And this housing diversity should reflect the range of household types we have in our region, including multi-generational and extended families and households consisting of unrelated adults, families who choose to live together in co-housing or co-living arrangements. And this housing diversity should be affordable to a range of incomes, as Peter said, from very low income to those who can afford market rate housing. Now, a great neighborhood is where one can move through all of life's stages, such as a growing family needing more space or a senior looking to downsize to age in place without leaving the social connections that they've generated in the neighborhood. But it also is more than a diversity of housing types. It also has a diversity of uses including ground floor retail space so that one can walk to the grocery store, or meet a friend for coffee. It has office space for businesses so that one might both work and live in the neighborhood. 
But a great neighborhood has more than this. It also has parks and playgrounds and schools nearby. Um, sorry, I lost some of my notes here. Um, it has childcare, community spaces, walkable streets with safe routes for pedestrians and people on bikes. A great neighborhood has access to robust transit so that one might live without a car in the $10,000 a year cost it entails while dramatically reducing one's carbon emissions. So we're on our way to having the transit part and we're spending nearly $60 billion to get there. What we don't have is the great neighborhood part and that's what Sound Communities is all about. So what I described will happen on its own at some transit stations, but at most it won't without some form of intervention as Peter's described. And even when it does happen, it will likely be a slow and piecemeal process. So that's really the strategy that we're putting in place. And if you do the math, and this is one of the studios that we did at school, Al Levine, who is also a Sound Communities steering committee member was involved in this. We had students look at the Kent Des Moines light rail station in the surrounding area. And they looked at all of these things that I described. They generated six plans. And those six plans included between 7,000 and 12,000 housing units within the half mile walk shed. So we're building roughly 60 transit stations in our region. If we had 10,000 housing units at each one, that would provide 600,000 homes over the next 20 years. So 60 great neighborhoods providing homes for 600,000 households. It's an ambitious vision, as Jessen said, but this is at the scale at which we need to be thinking about this problem and more importantly, this once in a lifetime opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. So um, if those of you are interested in taking a look, uh, the bill that we, so we introduced a bill last session in the House, it was 2898 and in the Senate, it was 6618. We're in the middle of refining the bill now. And so your feedback is really important. So um, I am gonna actually stop sharing the screen and um, maybe if Peter has any additional remarks, we can uh, do those. But then also I think we should jump in to some of the questions in the chat and I will kind of field some of those. So, um, so Peter, no. is there anything you wanna add before we jump into uh, questions? No, I think the dis dialogue would be much better than what I might be able to add. Okay, excellent. So I see some great uh, congratulations to Jess Zimbabwe who we've actually been working with in the chat, but let's put some questions or feedback um, in here and you know, one of the, th and as, as you all are thinking of your mess, as your, your tough questions for us, um, one of the things that's really on my mind with this is this idea in any kind of social movement or change, which is to say that if you really want to change people's minds, you have to change their hearts and you have to change the way they think about a particular topic. And we've seen sea changes on all kinds of issues, you know, like transportation, um, people talk about moving cars instead of transportation being about moving people. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of uh, key narrative shifts that we have achieved to do big things. And in the housing space, I think it really, we really have to move away from thinking about housing as something that individuals provide for themselves. And if you're able to do it, it's because you're somehow worthy of a house. Um, you know, and our kind of deep cultural narrative is that people who can't do that are somehow lacking. Um, and I really hope that we're able to change our cultural narrative to housing being something like transportation infrastructure that we provide for communally and that we think about um, in that same intentional and planned for way that we do with transportation. Transportation is not perfect, um, but on the other hand, we definitely see it as a government, uh, as a, you know, as a, as a communal responsibility. And I think we need to start to change our thinking around housing so that we can get to that place where we're doing these big scaled investments that we really need to be doing. And I would just tag on to that because I think that's a wonderful uh, analogy. Um, the pandemic is creating a difference in how we think about housing. Um, 
the installation of sound transit is causing us to think about how we fund things. That's a huge number. We've never done that before. Um, and we, we've never made such an investment. Um, so I think we're at a place where it's ripe for the really big idea. And that was the charter of this group right from the beginning. We, we have to think bigger. We were 240, are 240,000 units in the hole, headed to being uh, way deeper in the hole when 1.8 million more people show up. That's going to take a big, big idea. And it isn't going to happen in the first legislative session, as we learned. Um, and it may not happen in the second, but it's a conversation that I think is actually gaining some traction. And for me, the thing that resonates the most is that we are investing $53 billion in sound transit, the rail, but the rail is worth less, worthless, if we don't have people riding on it. And we're starting to get a flavor for that right now in the pandemic, which I believe we'll get through and we will return to some norms. But um, if we don't have people who can walk or access that to go into a job or go from a job to a house or from a, I mean, it's, it's a jobs housing balance as well. It creates that balance. And if we're not making that investment, then we are not getting a return on the 53 billion. No. Excellent. So I see some, I see some questions. Can I go ahead and, and uh, reward good behavior for folks who put in questions? So Angela, um, and Rick, why don't you jump in with the, an answer for this one? So the question is, can you speak a little more to the connection between the housing benefit district legislation and the analysis that's being done in Tacoma, Everett, and Renton? What are we, yeah, that's a great question. Well, it, it, is, it is a great question. One of the reasons we're doing the analysis is in fact, we, we had a question from state legislators, which is if we're making a public investment in this, what is the return on that investment? Um, what can I tell uh, my constituents to support this idea? So the study is really intended to do just that. If we make investments in basic infrastructure, in streets, um, in parks, in open spaces, how much value will that add to the development that's happening there? How can that value be captured? And then, um, create additional value as well as additional affordability. And there's a time value here as well. Yeah. We think of this idea as a catalyst, as an accelerator. Um, the experiences we're having today in Columbia City and Beacon Hill, yes, there's been some development there, but not near to its full potential. And so just letting it happen on its own, the market moves prices way up and starts to exclude other kinds of development. And so you get three or four nifty new buildings in something that should have, you know, 10,000 units around it. Not and then the, of course, the, the additional side of that was that displacement and the gentrification issues too were also not solved for by yeah. allowing things to just merely happen at, at the pace. And so the goal by having very deliberate uh, plans around uh, be around anti-displacement and um, being really intentional about that is the other part of I think this planning yeah. process. Yeah, it's really two sides. It's it's both to catalyze and accelerate, but also to regulate and control to ensure that we have a range of both market rate and affordable housing. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's both things. So there's some good questions. Uh, Kurt has a couple questions. One is PBT, uh, PTBAs give cities and counties uh, revenue, um, a sales tax and notwithstanding uh, vehicle license fees. Please describe the dedicated revenue sources. Um, I will just say that is definitely a work in progress and that has to be done hand in hand with legislators. It is a really heavy lift to get new taxing authority. Um, and new special purpose districts. Although what we would argue is that like a TBD, a transportation benefit district, the city council or the county council forms it. So it's not like you're creating this brand new government entity, standalone government entity. Uh, the bill currently has sales tax and property tax. And that was mostly as a placeholder recognizing that 
it is the wrong direction to continue to rely on regressive taxes. And so that is, you know, so if people have some creative ideas, like could we do a local option progressive REIT? I don't know, I'm throwing that out there, but um, this, is the, this is the hard work. Like there is just no getting around that. This is the place where, um, you know, the deep stakeholder work, the coalition building, the politics is gonna have to really, uh, come together to be able to get new authority. Like we are very uh, open-eyed about that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna do another question from Chris. Is the idea is the idea that this would receive funding from tax revenue first and then be self-sustaining with property sale proceeds? Peter, do you wanna take that one? Well, it depends on how you do this. If we if we use the revenue to create a bond, then that bond has to be repaid over time. But if we use the revenue as it comes in, we can spend it, um, uh, spend it all. My sense would be um, that I would like to see the money continue to be recycled. Yes, because of the subsidies involved, even the market value won't replenish that because we're only getting income from a third of the market value investments and the subsidies required at the lower levels are going to be, you know, strong. And so um, my notion is how many times can we use, let's use $50 million as the placeholder for um, the going in investment. How many times can we recycle it? And maybe each time we recycle it, 50 becomes 40, 40 becomes 30, 30 becomes 20. But over time, we've acquired thousands of potential unit opportunities. Excellent. So I see a question from Sarah Jane Siegfried. Hello, Sarah Jane. Nice to see you. Um, agreed, and her comment is agreed that housing should be a general benefit as in much of Europe. However, I suggest that affordable housing refers only to rental housing, except for a sliver of habitat type sweat equity. Yet our current low rise zoning results on almost exclusively townhouses for sale, the market isn't building ground related rental units. And I want to actually take a really wide lens on this particular point, which is to say that First of all, the market that we exist in is very much public policy created. We've just, a lot of the mechanisms have become invisible over time. So for example, the whole idea of a 30 year fixed rate mortgage was a consequence of an earlier housing crisis in the 1930s, right? The whole idea of a, mar of a government backed mortgage was not a thing before the 1930s and now, it is this kind of invisible way that government actually takes a really robust role in housing. And, and I would even go so far as to say a 30 year fixed rate mortgage is almost a kind of, it's a rent control or a cost control for homeowners, right? So as we're having these conversations around zoning and, and housing type, we also have to be having conversations around financing and access to credit and ownership models and rental stability models so that uh, the market is responding to our policy values, which it currently does not, I would argue. Um, so I just think that that's something that we really need to be intentional about this piece around financing. And I'll just say one last point about that. Urbanists, of which I am one, uh, we, we tend to really have fights around the diversity of housing type, which is really important. And we won a big win in Seattle around ADUs, but there was not a commensurate conversation around how to keep the, the ADUs or to create new mechanisms for uh, building affordable ADUs and keeping them affordable. So that is a place where we won the diversity and the housing type discussion, but left out the mechanisms for keeping and creating affordability. Okay, uh, here's another question uh, from Isaac. Hello, Isaac, how are you? Do you know how much revenue would be raised if King Pierce and Snohomish counties adopted both the uh, five tenths of a percent sales tax and the $1 per 1,000 on property taxes? I do not know that answer. I wonder if someone here has that kind of stuff at, on their fingertips. And if they do, feel free to put it in the chat. But Faith Peter, Pettis. Rick, do you want to weigh in on either? Peter, Faith, why don't you go and then Rick, you can jump in. Well, Faith Pettis, who was the chair of the HALA program, um, 
and is a bond council downtown, uh, works in this realm and is researching it for us because we asked ourselves the same question. What is the potential um, uh, taxing authority? Uh, and no, I'm sorry. But one of the things we're going to do in this study with city builders is understand the market value of uh, the full build out under current zoning. Um, and that is the first step towards adding value that is an assessment that can be potentially taxed in the future. Rick, do you wanna jump in on any of these questions that um, we've been talking through? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about the home ownership question because I, I think Sarah Jane raises a good point. I, I, I do know, at least in Seattle, there are some townhouses that are that are being rented, even, even new townhouses that are being rented, but I don't have the data on that. But we have been hearing quite a bit from state legislators and others about an interest in expanding opportunities for home ownership and the wealth building capacity that, that that can provide. And so that is something that we've been thinking quite a bit about. We have been thinking about where is that likely to happen? And the thought is that it would most likely happen at the perimeter of the walk shed where we would, that's where we would most likely see this missing, these mi missing middle housing types. But I think it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be. Um, for home ownership, they, they could be rentals, but part of our intention is to really look at expanding opportunities for home ownership at station areas, that it wouldn't Excellent. all be rental properties. Yep. Uh, Chris has a comment. Uh, fractured property ownership is also a big challenge to creating anything on large scale. Would this entity have eminent domain power? Um, and that is a really fraught political issue that I think we would prefer to not get into yet, you know, given that we are trying to build alignment and a coalition for this kind of idea. And having been a state legislator, I know that that is a particularly tricky question, although the point you make is really a good one, which is to say that it is really hard to assemble large parcels and all of that. So, Again, that is something that, you know, legislators would have to decide to really take on, I think. Um, but there is utility, clearly, in that. Peter or Rick, do you want to say anything more about it? But it is just, you know, at the end of the day, a really uh, tricky political question, particularly in Olympia, where there's obviously a lot of different opinions about that. Yeah, I think you're, you're saying it correctly. Um, we don't exactly know how that structure is going to work. Um, cities have eminent domain. Housing authorities have eminent domain. Sound Transit has eminent domain. Um, this particular entity may not. Um, so um, it may also not need it if it's working in the correct partnerships with public entities that exist. Yeah, existing public entities. Great. Are there other questions or comments? I'll read a comment from Sarah Jane. To achieve hundreds of affordable ADUs a year, the city could offer low interest loans to homeowners in exchange for renting at 80% of the market. And I mean, that's exactly the kind of creative thinking that we also need to be engaging in, not just with what our comp plans look and feel like and excellent, exciting tools like the one we're talking about, but also those mechanisms that really preserve and promote affordability for folks who are already in a community or who, you know, want to live close to a light rail station and don't currently. There's a lot of benefits to that. Any other comments? Okay. Um, Peter or Rick, do you want to close? Why don't we each take a couple seconds and just say a couple of closing comments? And of course, if you if something spurs a question, go ahead and put it in there. And um, and Emily, if you somehow were able to join us, we'd love to hear something from you too. So, um, Peter, do you want to wrap? We'll each say like thirty seconds of kind of wrapping it up. You're a good moderator. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, um, it, it, it seems like a 
big hill to climb, a big mountain to climb. Um, I'm, I'm empowered by Jessen's remarks. I've heard her say this a couple of times. I'm empowered by the sense I get for change on a lot of different fronts. Things are not working the way we'd hoped. And this might be the time, the opportunity to do something really big. And so, yes, in my darkest day, I sweat over the detail of, well, this, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to do that? And, and, and well, we should, but um, it should not cause us to pause. We, we need to keep trying to roll this uphill and shape it as we go. Um, and frankly, I'm encouraged by the enthusiasm I get from electeds and um, people who are gonna have to take on some of these big ta tax tasks. Um, and so there's enthusiasm for it. There's trepidation. Um, Frankly, we're at the very beginning stages. We've been through the legislature once with great feedback and support. And they're saying, bring it on, bring it back. Uh, let's talk about it, let's hone it. Um, so there's a hunger for it, which is encouraging even in the face of such a big idea. But that's what big ideas are about, right? We don't have all the answers to how to get the man to the moon, but we're gonna get him there. Yep. Or her. Thank you, Peter. Rick, do you have a yeah, couple I, I, I closing agree with Peter. Thoughts? It's it's been incredibly encouraging meeting with legislators who have an enormous amount on their plate at this time and, and they remain very enthusiastic about this idea. Building on a point that Peter made earlier and Jessen, it's something that you've said several times is the fact that it's like two sides of a coin. We're building the transit part and we're not building the housing part. And it's really a question of scale. We've become very comfortable with the idea of investing large sums of money on transit infrastructure. And we really need to become more comfortable with the idea of investing large sums of public money on housing, really seeing housing as fundamental infrastructure, just the way we see transportation. Um, and so that's, that's the way we're viewing this. And I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and for asking some really fantastic questions. Um, a lot of these are things that we have been wrestling with. And a lot of this is really striking a balance between this entity having enough authority to actually do what it's intended to do while at the same time encouraging, not frightening, but encouraging local jurisdictions to participate as collaborators and partners in this effort. And thank you, Rick, That's, those are great points. And I would just say in closing, we should not be afraid of being really creative right now. We're in a crisis that is on par with the Great Depression. The eviction moratorium is has been extended, but how we're going to manage after that is looming. And this is of course on top of the really big housing crisis that we're already facing. And, um, you know, we have an opportunity to do things really differently, to do things much bigger than we ever dreamed we could. And I think, again, part of that is that government and communal collective action has a really big role. I mean, the housing market of today is because of cre what was considered creative um, you know, 70 to 80 years ago. And of course, we now, you know, all agree that that creativity had big benefits and it really left people out. It really encapsulated a deep racism that was built into the way we finance and build housing and who gets it and who doesn't. And so I want us to think big and to think creatively and we really have this opportunity to rectify the mistakes of the past and to build communities that are, you know, thriving for all of us, which I think we all want. So with that, if you are interested in hearing more about this idea, I put um, Emily's email in the chat and we can set up some time to brief you to get your feedback. Again, we are workshopping this idea and want your help. Um, and uh, again, we really appreciate the time that you took with us today. And I look forward to the day when we all get to be in the same room together. So uh, in the meantime, stay safe and wear your mask. And we look forward to talking housing again. Take care. Thanks, Justin, for moderating. You got it. Thanks, everybody.